Is my mic on? Yeah, good. Okay. Good morning. Well, first thing is, I know pretty certainly that no one here is technical, because it's nine o'clock and you're actually up, you're not in bed. Uh, and if it wasn't for me speaking, I would also be in bed. So um, I'm going to tell you how to avoid screen up technology. So first of all, given it's morning, I'm not going to talk about technology, because the problem with technology usually isn't technology, it's people. Because people don't know what they want until they see it. So anyone who's been involved in kind of a process of, of selecting technology, choosing technology, implementing technology, has probably been through this little process, gets stuck in a feedback loop. I want to know uh, what you want the software to do. What does your software do already? Well, I don't know. You've got to tell me. And you get into this, this requirements loop. The solution to that, to a certain extent, is, is product managers. And these are people who have a good, uh, good kind of mix of user experience skills, technology skills, business skills. And what they'll do is, rather than asking for requirements, they'll start to try and do process discovery. So I kind of ban the word requirements. It's the first way of screwing up technology is to ask people what their requirements are. There's no such thing as requirements. First of all, if you say what are your requirements, they assume they're going to get it because it's a requirement. What you want to do instead is look for what people's pain points are, um, what are their latent needs, what are they trying to achieve, start with the objectives. You know, if, you, if you're looking at implementing a CRM, the guy who's got a Rolodex on his desk doesn't think he needs a CRM. So if you say, what do you need, he's probably going to say, well, I need a bigger Rolodex. Um, so you, know, you want to look at um, trying to define the problem, uh, the solution rather than the problem. Another question always comes up when you're selecting or, or looking at new technology is, do I buy some technology? Do I go and find a vendor? Do I build my own? Do I look to the cloud and kind of rent it? So I'm going to quote our, our late chairman. If it flies, floats, or fornicates, always rent it. It's cheap in the long run. <laughs> Same is true of technology. Basically, and this is unusual for someone with a technical background to say, writing code should be a last resort. Always, always, always avoid writing code. You shouldn't really want to build your own. Every line of code you write has to be maintained. Code has a habit of proliferating. Um, but if you do write code, you know, do it properly. And the problem is when you, when you undertake it lightly. So you normally you go and speak to a developer and they'll say, yeah, it's easy, yeah, we'll build our own. <laughs> That's how much work the developers think is involved. That's all the shit they haven't thought of. <laughs> so what you need to do is you need to speak to developers and find out what's all that stuff below the iceberg. It's kind of like you know the, the Spanish Inquisition. You need to quiz and quiz and quiz them and find out what they haven't thought about, what assumptions have they made. The interesting, though, is that developers have a habit of, of doing the reverse as well at the same time. So this is something that happens quite a lot. Every day, this happens with developers. If you wonder why projects slip, it's because every day they're doing this. It just won't take long. I'll just do this thing. And so what, what good product managers will do is work with developers to find quicker solutions. They'll try and not only look at what's under, what's under the water and what's in the iceberg that they've forgotten about, but they'll find out if they're trying to build an arbitrary system to pass condiments. Um, so, you know, you've got, to, you've got to find out, do you need that particular thing right now? Are you going to need it? The answer is probably no. And, you know, you've got to be basically pragmatism. It's all about pragmatism. So, you know, can, can you have a solution which involves cut and paste? Cut and paste can save you millions. Sometimes, you know, armies of manual labor people are cheaper than getting developers in. And it's, again, weird for a technologist to say that. Um, then the other problem you get is that you've, you think you've already got a system. We've already got one of those. Sunk costs, so you've, you've just spent 100,000 pounds on a new system, it's a bit shit, but you've spent 100,000 pounds on it, you're probably still writing down the capex, capex over five years, maybe you gave up on it after a year. But you've got to make sure that those decisions on what you've done already doesn't influence your thinking in terms of what you're gonna do in the future. So you've got to look at legacy systems, look at the technical debt. So technical debt is basically when the cost of making a change outweighs the benefit of that change. And if you get to the point where that happens, you have to declare technical bankruptcy, which basically means bin it, start again. 
it's actually the right thing to do. You know, if everyone goes to the casino and you've put 100,000 on the table playing poker and you get a crap hand, doesn't necessarily mean you should continue betting. And that's what people do with tech, though. But ultimately, you know, this is about being lean and agile. I don't mean that kind of lean agile as one of our magazines. Um, that, that was me, by the way, but um, before I became a technologist. Uh, so you've got to adopt lean principles. So uh, if you haven't read it, I really recommend the book The Lean Startup by uh, Eric Ries. And it talks about kind of these seven things and the virtuous circle of, of trying to build, test, and measure. What you're trying to do is kind of um, follow these Japanese manufacturing techniques of eliminating waste. Everything you do should be about learning. So you've probably heard the phrase, um, you know, if you're going to fail, fail fast. But it's not about, the objective is not to fail. You do want to fail fast if you're going to fail, but it's not, you're not trying to fail. What you're trying to do is learn. So failure is fine as long as you've learned something, and as long as you then put that back into the process and, and change something. Part of that is about deciding as late as possible. So what I mean by that is that if you spend... Um, loads of time up front trying to design the perfect system. You know, you, you can be there for a long time. Well, you're better off designing bits of it and then keep moving on, keep moving on, and actually delivering value. The sooner you actually do that, the, better, the sooner you're getting the value out of it. So that then leads into delivering as fast as possible. <clears throat> but, you know, empowering the team, all that kind of stuff. Presumably, by now, everyone's heard of Agile and hopefully following Agile. Um, these are the, this is the Agile Manifesto. Um, unfortunately, what usually happens, though, is you get the half-assed Agile Manifesto. Um, so I'm going to read these out now. So you have individuals interactions over processes and tools, but we have mandatory processes and tools to control those individuals. You've got working software over comprehensive documentation, as long as that software is comprehensive documented. You've got customer collaboration over contract negotiation within the strict boundaries of contracts and, of course, subject to rigorous change control. Responding to change over following a plan, provided a detailed plan is in place to, to respond to the change and is followed precisely. So that is, whilst the items on top sound nice, we're an enterprise company. There's no way we're letting go of the rest. The other thing is to fear commitment. You know, you, you, you're trying to make decisions on technology and you're trying to choose technology and maybe doing capitalization over five years. Who the hell knows what's going to be in five years? You know, we, we, we've got a kind of automated marketing system we're replacing. The old one was put in place before Facebook existed. I think we've only just finished, uh, you know, capexing it. So, you know, look at, look at your contracts when you, you're building or buying or, or looking at software and technology and think, can I, can I predict the future five years hence? Do I really want to sign a five-year contract, even if they gave me a lovely discount? Um, you've got to assume you're going to outgrow that solution, because not only is your business going to change, but the world's going to change around you. So you want flexibility. But you need to also you know, do what's right for now. And kind of touching on that already, which is um, the word enterprise. Unless they're talking about a starship, if someone says the word enterprise, run the other direction. Um, Anything that describes itself as, as enterprise is basically a synonym for expensive and, fle and inflexible. So, you know, enterprise, enterprise cloud, ooh, great, brilliant, expensive cloud. Um, but you want to go cloud-based, you want to look at browser-based solutions, you want to pick solutions with APIs, integrations that can talk to other systems. Um, you want to actually give a shit about the user interface. You know, people don't think about that, but if, you're, if you're, the user interface of the system you're putting in is crap, no one's going to use it. If it's beautiful and easy to use, then you're going to get better ROI. People are going to use it, adopt it, learn, um, and, and experiment more. So I'm actually way ahead of time, I'm afraid. Um, but, you know, start the day as we need to go on. Um, so kind of recap. Uh, it's about people, not technology. You need to empower product managers. First of all, have product managers. But you need to empower them and make sure they can say no. <laughs> Uh, make sure they don't talk about requirements. They need to focus on what the objectives are, what people's needs are that they haven't yet expressed. Um, you know, find out whether they really want a bigger Rolodex or they need a CRM. You want to write, write code as last resort. Look at renting it. Um, look out for the iceberg under the water. You've got to ensure pragmatism. 
um, because it doesn't often happen naturally. And projects will slip by, you know, five minutes every day, adds up to months and months and months. Um, and ultimately, you need to act like a startup and not like an enterprise, unless you're a starship. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Paul. Hold on a sec. No, no, no. Good boy, Yeah, yeah. You, you, Wrong you, way. No, no. You, you, we've got questions. All oh, right, sorry. Go back on up. Damn it. My God. He really sorry, it's too early. Darted off there. Too early. Uh, <laughs> um, before we, we open up to questions, I have one. I was waiting for a specific screw up. Can you walk us through a specific I do all that stuff, up? so, you know. Yeah. What's that? I do all that. I follow that, so the next one. What's, what is <laughs> one project that screwed up and, and why? <clears throat> Let me think. Um, so, so when I talked about um, contracts and, and, and Agile, it is actually important when you're doing an Agile project to get the contract right because you need to know what's going to happen when things do go wrong because ultimately they do go wrong. So we had a, uh, a project where you go through discovery, you know, bad times, during the summer, so everyone, half people are on holiday, you're kind of rushing it through, um, yeah, I'm sure that contract's fine, you know, you're kind of going through detail, and it's all good, it's all going good, and then they hand over the system, and whole swathes of requirements have been missed. It just simply doesn't do the basics what we need to do. So. You then spend a bit of time arguing about whose fault is it, you know, uh, did, did the, were the requirements captured or not. You start going over the contracts and trying to prove who's right and who's wrong. Um, but if you get the contract right in the first place, then you don't need to do that. But what you want is you want the contract to, to allow, um, rather than being, you know, design everything up front, right now that's locked in and you can't change it. And if you want to change it, we have to have an argument about cost where you've got these incremental points. So the project we had recently, we had to kind of go back to base principles and start again and just go, right, what are we trying to achieve here? And have that fight over the contract. So hopefully it'll kind of come out. I can't name names because we're in the middle of actually fixing it. But, yeah, so, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I wanted to open up to uh, other questions. Um, let's see. Chris has one in the back. <clears throat> Hi. Between uh, commercial teams and digital development teams, you know, what, what sorts of issues sort of come up? Because I'm sure everyone in the room has, has got their own uh, challenges in, in working with these two different two yeah. different teams with different sort of uh, languages and mindsets, really. Yeah. So um, I guess with us, most of our revenue is is kind of advertising based. So the conversations about commercial are usually around advertising, um, and that usually means that the product managers, with their kind of user experience hat on, uh, want to remove all the adverts, and uh, for some reason the commercial guys don't want that. Don't know why. So um, it's very easy to build a beautiful website. Um, it's a lot harder to do it when you're trying to put adverts on in a way that makes you money. And so a lot of the conflict will be um, us trying to find out the actual data to see whether or not actually people are still buying Skies, um, because they're a bitch for, for trying to design your website around them. So, you know, we, we often have that conversation, and, and it'll change over time, but that's a lot of the conflict is, is us saying, you know, we think we should do this and move in this direction commercially, but commercially we're not ready for it because it takes, it takes a while to start re-engaging agencies. So, you know, mobile ad formats and that kind of stuff, um, the, the, the product and technology guys will have one view, commercial guys have a different view. It takes a bit of time to reach a conclusion, I guess. Okay, any other uh, questions? A couple of microphones. One in the front. Morning. Morning. Um, as a CTO, mm -hmm. what, um, how do you go about prioritizing projects within the company when I'm guessing you have lots of people shouting at you to do different things? Yeah, actually, yeah. Um, how do you put them in order? Well, so um, what we do at Dennis is we've, we've got kind of 20 something websites and um, we pool our development resource. <laughs> So we don't have, you know, three guys working on this brand, three guys working on that brand. We don't even have, you know, teams working on different sectors. It's just one big pool of, of development resource. So what that allows us to do is very quickly respond to, to changes and needs, um, but also kind of uh, over a period of years flex which brands we invest in and which ones we don't. So um, 
we're, in terms of kind of day-to-day -day prioritization, that's up to the product managers to do. It needs to be some people who are there seeing what's going on. But in terms of what, what projects and what um, brands they're focusing on, um, the management team kind of set that as a, as a goal for kind of on a quarterly basis, really. Um, but st you know, stuff comes up. You, know, one, you get hit by Google Panda, then suddenly you kind of drop everything and you want to focus on a different website that's hit by Google Panda. You, know, you can't, there's so many things you can't control. Um, but we, we know what brands we want to invest in. We know what brands um, there's opportunity in. So you spend a pound on that brand, pound on that brand, that was going to make more. Um, obviously, you're looking at things that are short-term wins versus things that are important over time that you just need to kind of get done. So um, I don't know if that's answered the question. Thanks. Oh my god, this is spotlight. There's a lot of light up here. So thanks for having me. Um, as uh, just mentioned, this is the title for, uh, for this session, Bringing Brand Advertising to a Programmatic Era. And why is this important for you as a publisher? So just a bit of background. Actually, I changed it yesterday. It should have been the Viking, not the Dane. If you look at my boots, I have, have Viking boots in Monaco. So. Besides my broken English, I'm working for, for Adform and uh, is responsible for our publisher solution. I have all eight years experience on, on the publisher side and pre-all Adform I established the, the first programmatic network in Denmark uh, two years ago. We actually 12 premium publishers going together in one offering for, uh, for the trading desk and sharing the data. I have a lot of experience in, in hands-on regarding technology. So this presentation will be, from my point of view, where you should a publisher should act in, in this space, right? So I've been asking this question a lot of time. Who's Adform? What is Adform actually doing? We are an independent technology provider serving uh, both sides supply and demand. It started and founded in Copenhagen 2002 based on third-party ad serving for agencies and, and advertisers. Um, it moved more into programmatic space as the programmatic environment was involving. So now we have a DSP, we have private marketplace on the supply side, and actually we're going to launch uh, a programmatic publisher ad server soon. So we're based in uh, Copenhagen and have offices across Europe, uh, 500 employees, and just launched uh, two offices, in, in, one in New York and one in LA as well. So, sorry for this, there won't be any loom escape today, um, but, but just to set the scene of how we at Adform actually see where our digital inventory is, is heading at the moment. We divided the, the inventory into four categories, A, B, C, and D, and actually this is, from my point of view, quite important for you as a publisher to find out where your sales force actually should use or spend the time. So actually, if we look at the bottom D, right? This is actually where we saw in the US uh, a lot of RCB took off, uh, US publishers starting to sell bulk remnant inventory in a more efficient way. Um, then we saw a shift in Europe, actually, uh, the Telegraph Media Group, the guys are in the room here, uh, actually had a, 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 another approach to programmatic, actually taking a DSP in-house and actually using uh, the benefits of, of programmatic advertising in a more um, intelligent way. So, so actually, the, the conclusion of this slide here is actually, for our point of view, B, C, and D is, is actually quite easy to automate, but, but the last thing is A, it's about content partnership, native advertising, and so on. Actually, this is where the sales force should be spending the time. Um, so, what we actually conclude here is actually, we had a discussion last night actually expensive guys should actually sell expensive product. So this should be A. So a lot of question about programmatic. Is it just waste to bottom in terms of CPM price? Uh, at Adform, we do a trend report every quarter uh, across the market in Europe. So wh what we saw in, in 2013 compared to 2014, we saw an uplift in, in CPM price in, in 20%. Furthermore, just about the opportunity in, in, in programmatic branding or programmatic spend, we saw an uplift from 2013 to 2014, 250%. So there's a big opportunity out there for a publisher, but these guys, hopefully you know them. Uh, I do. I, I, not personally, but I know the brands of them. Uh, if you look at Facebook, um, 
Microsoft and, and, and Google, these three guys is actually having the, the big piece right now. And why? Actually, that's some reason, quite obviously. If you look at Facebook and the others, they have scale, they have reach, they have a lot of data to do cross device on mobile, tablet, display. So actually, they have the capability of doing direct response DR campaigns. These guys are really, really good at doing scale and reach and having DR campaigns to the, to the table, right? But I think there's a missing, there's a big opportunity for a publisher now, what these guys actually is missing. And that's about programmatic branding. Actually bringing branding advertisers to the pro programmatic space. I'll uh, later on show a case we did with Burberry. And finally, automation. I think there's still a huge opportunity for buy and sell side to automate more than we see today. It's not only about RTB. You can actually be more efficient in your way of selling. So what are brand advertisers actually asking for at the moment? We have a lot of insight as we're acting as a DSP as well. This is quite, these four things is quite important for, for brand advertisers. It's about creative, create awareness, drive engagement. They want to have high impact formats in a digital environment. They want to, to use creativity in, in a digital environment. Even more, they would like to have premium inventory based on local data. They won't waste media spend in, in users they don't know. They want to know where they've been shown and, and which kind of data has been used on it. The third one, I think it's really, really important now is to talk about new metrics in the market. I think if you go to a brand advertisers and, and, and actually tell them that they have a CTR rate of 0.2, it was like, how can I use this in my boardroom? We need to talk about new metrics like engagement wave, in, in view uh, metrics, and so on. Actually, I saw Financial Times is, is actually a bit ahead of the curve talking about selling cost per time instead of selling CPM prices. I think there will be a big shift in, in the way of selling digital uh, inventory and in, in further on. So if we want to, to have more brand advertisers into the programmatic space, we need to talk about the metrics. For sure, if these is three are fulfilled, they could use the benefits of programmatic buying, that's efficiency, and using their own data. So what does this mean for you as a publisher? If you want to fulfill the requirements for, for brand advertisers, it's quite important that you actually have your, your tech, tech stack in order. It's, these guys would like to make sure that the ad has been seen by a human being, not a robot. There have been some, some quite bad examples out there. Uh, guaranteed viewability. If we want to talk about brand metrics, we, may, we need to make sure that the ads actually have been seen. Cross device targeting, the ability of using your login data from paywalls, whatever, to cross device the, uh, the, the audience. And finally, I think it's about bringing more high impact formats to, to the brand advertisers in a programmatic way. These uh, is quite key requirements to get brand advertisers to start doing more programmatic branding. And why is it so important? Which, this is based on Adform Trend Report uh, last year as well. So actually, if you had a look here in, in, in regarding uh, CPM prices, we saw a huge lift in, in prices, branding formats compared to standard format. That's what we actually see in 250% lift, that's across all uh, markets in, in Europe where we actually is, is, is acting. Even more, I think there's still a big opportunity. Where everybody knows that time spent on mobile versus display is almost, in some publishers, 50 to 50. But if you look at the revenue share, it's, it's, it's not there yet. And we, we know for sure that you know, mobile needs to be broken. We had a good example yesterday how to, to, to use mobile in an advertising way. So the opportunity here is, is still on mobile in a programmatic way. So this one, I mentioned it before. Um, we, we did a lot of brand advertiser case out there, but, but the latest one we did was out of the UK office. We did a great job together with, with Burberry and Amnet uh, and Yahoo. Uh, actually, this is a bespoke uh, format across uh, five of Yahoo key markets in Europe. Uh, full page takeover for one day, uh, brought in a programmatic way. So I think the learning for this one is actually Burberry selling the, the, the goods offline, actually driving engagement and awareness online. 
uh, I think this is a really good case study to, to go to the market with as well. So finally, I want to speak about automation. Um, I think it's, it might be the, the new black you saw, Rubicon uh, acquired iSocket ad slot teamed up with Pubmatic regarding automated guaranteed. So if you just look at the landscape, how it's, it's working today, actually, if you have a look at the auction base, this is actually where we see RTB, we see deals. This is, bit, this is in auction, right? Everything will be in an auction, and it's unreserved inventory. But the new thing as, as BuySide and is asking for and even brand advertisers is to get automated guaranteed, you know, having fixed price and make sure that your impression will be delivered in a guaranteed way, but still using the capability of data and efficiency. So I think what this is creating is efficiency for publisher and for buy side. For example, this was done by, oh, I need to mention this, not designed by Adform. I was, my CMO was like, I haven't designed this one. So this is designed from the Boston Consulting Group. They did a analyze for a typical media planner. This is actually how a day for a media planner looks like to start in order to start a campaign. They do a lot of planning. They had a lot of uh, client approval, waiting for negotiating, waiting for, for the creative to be approved. So actually what automated guaranteed is actually trying to do is actually to put this one uh, planning action into actualization. Um, instead of using three days in, in planning, you can actually go in an automated way and buy your inventory. I don't have it for the sell side, but I think if you look at the ad operation on sell side, from my knowledge, I think the, the picture might be the same. So there is a win for both sides in, in automated guaranteed. So conclusion here, guys, it's if you want to have a bigger piece of the pie, I think it's more important to have to offer high impact format for brand advertisers. We need to have more brand advertising into the space in, in, to increase your, your yield. Uh, and even more, if you want to be more efficient, go and, and, and have a th think about how you can automate your way of selling. It could be automated guarantee, it could be programmatic. Um, these are, are the topics that, that will uh, make sure you have a bigger piece of the pie. Thanks. Yeah, that's me doing the do with Betty Boo. Anybody remember that? Um, I am going to go as quickly as I can through what programmatic means for me and what it means for a lot of people. Um, I could just leave this slide up and everybody would be great, but it doesn't really work that way. Um, a little bit about ourselves. RTE is the um, Irish national broadcaster and I work for the digital division, which basically reaches out to nearly half the population in any given month. We work across mobile, web, AV, um, everything that we can monetize in a non-linear fashion. So they're pretty good numbers, but when you think about nearly 900 million websites, 3 billion people online, it's quite difficult to actually think how you will get a cut through in that regard. And when we estimate that there are approximately 30 billion ads being served every month in Ireland uh, to 4.5 million people, work that one out, um, it's really, really difficult for us to sort of say how can we make a place in that. We're competing with people's time. It's being cut up more and more each day. And we're competing with all this social media. So the audience is fragmenting across many, many platforms, many, many divisions. When you even look at the mobile space, there are 19,000 19, different variants of Android. Now, most people will say, well, what's the so what of that? If you have an Android app, you're not going to be able to reach all those 19,000 devices because there are variants across it and it's just unwieldy to do. A lot of talk has been uh, over the last couple of days with regards to mobile. We get 70% of our traffic from mobile devices. Um, we hit a tipping point of 50% in April 2012 um, and monetizing mobile was a big, big issue for us three years ago. Um, once we hit the 50%, we took a different view. It's not really mobile, it's just RTE. Um, and that's where we sort of started building on what we were going to do in terms of monetizing, both in terms of just a direct sales space, but also in terms of programmatic. 
When you add in, Martin had his slide, this is my slide in terms of a digital campaign, you're sort of saying, this is just crazy. Fragmentation, uh, planning, delivery, everything else, it's just making it ripe for programmatic. Programmatic will answer everything. So it gets in your, DM, your uh, PMPs, it gets in your long tail, everything's cool. Gets rid of all the inefficiencies, you can even get rid of your sales team. So everyone's a winner. <laughs> Unfortunately not. We talked about um, the Lumascape yesterday. There were 245 uh, players in the AdTech Lumascape. Now, Scott Brinker in um, Chief Martech has basically added everything in. So you've got your uh, mobile space, you've got your uh, ad tech space, you've got your big data space, you've got your marketing automation space. And essentially what's happened in the last 12 months, that space has doubled. It hasn't consolidated. So even in terms of the um, ad automation, ad tech area, that's fragmenting as well. So the big question is, what does programmatic actually mean? And Tim, this is the bit where I am actually going to read it. All right. Automated buying and selling of digital advertising informed by data based on computational proxy bidding on behalf of human masters. That's what programmatic means. Yeah? Well, this is what it means for most people. Um, so the difficulty you have with programmatic is in this technology space, we tend to overestimate what we can deliver in three years and underestimate what we can deliver in the next five. I'm not a technology skeptic, but I am a digital pragmatist. I would describe programmatic at this moment in time as still being in beta. It is constantly evolving, constantly being developed. You can't answer mobile. You've got all these DMPs, all these various data aggregators saying we can you know, target your audience based on cookies, everything else, but they can't. If you can't read that, the Blue Kai mobile registry is coming soon. It's been coming soon for some time. So you can't answer it in terms of mobile. Then you've got cookie deletion. A third of online users delete their cookies seven times a month. You also have in the bottom there, zombie cookies, which is great. And you've got a fear of logo soup in terms of your ad appearing wherever it is. So it's a bit of blind leading the blind, and I haven't even got onto ad fraud, nor will I, Tom. That's your, your bit. But it is a bit of whack-a-mole because ad fraud is like dealing with drug cheats. It's moving all over the place. You have problems with in-targeting. Never mind the content in terms of the six most terrifying sex illustrations on Wikipedia. I can send you on the URL if anybody wants to know them. But you have two competing telco brands appearing on the same page. If I did that as a direct sale as a publisher, I would have my head kicked in by the agency. But it's okay and programmatic. It's also okay and programmatic to go and advertise on adult sites. In no other industry do brand advertisers advertise around adult content? So why is it with uh, digital? And that's what I wake up every Monday morning thinking. But let's not despair. You take a step and you say, OK, we're all trying to boil the ocean here. Stop. Smell the flowers, think a little bit, and sort of say, okay, how can I best use this to my ability? Well, for a start, stop buying bad traffic. If programmatic, stop buying bad traffic, everything would be cool. And people need to put their hands up and say, we're going to stop doing that. You also have to look at data in a proper and meaningful way. If data is the new black, first party data is the new gold. And that's the approach we took. You start using machine learning and all this cool stuff, and if anybody wants to know what dimensionality reduction is, come up to me at the end and I'll try and spoof it. But data is nothing without insight. And that's where there's a lack. 
at this moment in time in the industry. You've got between 50 and 65% of respondents in quite a lot of surveys, um, ranging from e-consultancy to think form, saying that they've got, all these marketeers are sitting on so much big data, but they actually don't know what to do with it. So bad data is actually worse than having no data at all. And this places an opportunity for publishers. Very few publishers, less than 10%, actually have measured and taken in first-party data and started using it for themselves. I had to put this up because episode seven is coming this year, and you know, it does feel like a trap, but unlike uh, Admiral Akbar, it's not. You just need to think about it. Um, and don't despair, there are some things in, uh, in terms of enlightenment coming. For me, I took a step back and I said, okay, let's, let's sort of get down to what we're actually in business for. We're not in business for programmatic. Too often there has been the tail wagging the dog. We're in business to reach out to our audience, to delight our customers, and I monetize that. So we've sort of created a culture of distraction. So what? <laughs> Seriously, I have, I have a health band. My, my lovely wife bought it for me. Right? Amongst other things, it can tell me that my phone is ringing. That's what I have a phone for. So, you know, there's certain things that we need to just understand. We're actually in an era of people power. We're living in a culture of an on-demand nation. And it's the people we need to start looking at. We need to remember as well, because there was talk there, Martin mentioned it in terms of remnant inventory. This is Ted McConnell, he's executive VP of um, the Advertising Research Foundation in the States. And he said, there's no such thing as a remnant customer. And he's right. And there's no such thing as remnant inventory either. You just need to get the insight out of it and bring it to your customers. And by doing that, that allows you to stand out. The biggest challenge I see with programmatic at this moment in time is there is still a lack of transparency in it. If you're using programmatic, you can end up just being wrapped up in a brown paper bag and put on a supermarket shelf. What difference do you actually make? So your audience is the difference that you actually make. We need to know what delights our customers. And by knowing that, we then delight our customers. And we get more customers. And we get more insight about them. And then using that in a programmatic space, then you are getting a greater value. Start measuring people, not cookies. And one thing as well, back to the 30 billion ads, we're not always on. Our customers actually sleep. So we took a view in terms of looking at um, our audience across all our platforms. I hope my clock works here. Yay. Across the day, and looked at various touch points in terms of what they do, how they do it. We've meshed data across uh, bespoke research, across our own uh, data analytics, and we've come out with insights in terms of being able to say that of those who are using um, our on-demand player, 44% of 18 to 24-year-old males are viewing it in their bedroom. We don't do any adult content, so I don't know why, but that's what they do. That allowed us then to put in a plan. So in 2013, we started recruiting uh, first-party data. We launched out with um, a sign-in, which allowed you to have uh, seamless viewing across platforms on our, our player. We then got a single unit of analytics across all our platforms. As we rolled out 
um, an iterative process in terms of how we developed things, we added in new analytics. So we had four or five different analytics packages because the original one, back to Paul's point, you know, dated back 10 years, it couldn't do what we wanted to do then. So we threw out everything and started afresh. We're now in a position where we've got the data in, we've cleaned it down, we've got one CRM, and we're actually starting to segment our audiences. Segmenting our audiences now lets us to actually use uh, programmatic, amongst other things, in a much more functional and effective manner. We can actually say we've got uh, well-to-do ABC1 millennials. It's that package. We've got mo young mothers with kids. That's a package. We've got health enthusiasts. That's another package. Now, we've all had to do this, and it's really important to remember that. We've all had to do that by making sure that we uh, manage that data in a very, very trustworthy manner. So we work on the basis of trust, consent, and transparency. We tell you what we're going to be doing with the data. And it's important to do that with your customer. As I said, we can now segment our iceberg, and we can start making more money from it. And we've approached programmatic in a way, not reduce, reuse, recycle, but retain, or recruit, retain, reduce. We've used it to recruit new customers. We've had customers who are UK customers who have been buying ad networks and haven't bought our content because they just wanted to get reach at a cheap price. We went to them and we said, in the example I, I mentioned, we've young males on their own in the bedroom. That's the audience you want and they started buying at a premium price because they could see the value of it. We've used it to retain customers. Some customers just say, we're gonna buy it that way, so if you wanna be in it, that's the way you have to do it. And we've grown one customer from a couple of thousand to a six-figure sum. It takes a lot of work, and that's the part of the reduction piece that we aren't there yet. Most people say that uh, programmatic will reduce administration. It doesn't. It is highly administrative. So the recruit bit works, the retain bit works. We're working on the reduce bit. Similar to Martin, we aim to be in the PMP space. We were trying to get into PMP space before we knew what a PMP was four years ago. That's essentially how you do a direct deal at this moment in time. That works. Then if you can't get those going, you can make it broader and go into the private auction. Again, it's reserving, it's price floors. That works as well. Try and steer clear of this. It's just mayhem. So what has all that done for us? What it's done has grown our programmatic revenues from being about 5% of our revenues to just being under 12% in two years. But that's not the only story. We've also diversified. Um, we've launched uh, a paid subscription sports channel to our international audiences. We launched it last summer. Um, and in year one, we sold it in 152 different countries. It broke even. Year one, I think that's a good result. We've also invested heavily in rich media. Um, Martin mentioned that as a top tier. We've actually worked with that forum in terms of doing curtain reveals. And we've got good press out of this. It's also grown revenue significantly in a high premium, high profile space. And the reason I mention this is because programmatic isn't the be all and end all. You need to remember why you're in the business. Our rich media revenues have grown from being 16% of our revenues to just short of 30% of our revenues as a consequence of this. It has made us different. By us being different, it has made our clients look different. And they've st stood out. They've won awards because of it. So I was asked to leave three points. If I could leave just one, it would be this. Programmatic is a tool. It's not a strategy. It enables you. It doesn't drive your business unless you're a programmatic technology seller. It doesn't drive your business. And that leads to my next point. This is not an ancient Irish proverb, though it can be if you wish. Um, essentially, 
The tail does not wag the dog. Remember why you're in business. You're in business to delight your customers. And that goes on to my third point. First party data is future critical. It, when you strip back everything, it is the only thing that separates you from your competitors. Be it that you're, you know, as a user, I go on to RTE, I go on to BBC, I go on to Guardian, I go on to Times, but I use each site in a different manner. And as that, that first party data is different for each publisher. So that's me. Thank you for listening. <laughs>